this guy's got a tender heart, what do you folks think? <laughs> um, it's good to hear someone pour their heart out in prayer. And uh, I always kid with those pastors that, that when they preach, they, they tear up and they choke up, but it's just, it's, it's just wholehearted love for the Lord, and it's encouraging, and it's a blessing. So I appreciate those prayers. Um, this morning, we're going to uh, take a little break again from Matthew. Um, we, we look to take breaks here and there as we work through this long uh, book of the Bible. And, and the reason is, I think it's appropriate, last week we had Tommy Eccles here. He preached on mission. And next week we're going to have Noah Corshi here, who is a, a missionary. So I think both their conversations are going to center around preaching the gospel. So I thought I might find a portion of scripture that, that drives this idea home. And I can be the centerpiece between those two gospel conversations. Uh, I want to see the fact this week that we are called to preach the gospel if indeed the gospel has changed our lives in any way. Uh, as I said, it's going to be three parts. I'm here in the middle section. I'm the meat and the sandwich. Uh, but we're called to preach the gospel indeed. I think it's clear if we've been changed by the gospel. And this portion of scripture I read, I think is going to drive it home quite clearly uh, as Paul was called to preach the gospel to those in, in Corinth. Uh, there was a time when, when Paul was discouraged and, and there was you know, a lot of things that, that made him think these folks weren't the folks he should be preaching to. You read in the eight, 17th chapter of Acts that the Lord tells him, Listen, I have many people here, so don't be discouraged. He preached there, and he preached the gospel faithfully for three years. So let's stand up and read a little bit of, of what Paul has, has given us here in the second letter to the Corinthians. I'm going to be reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 11 through chapter 6, verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 11 through 6, 2. <clears throat> Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we, are all, but we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known to you, in, to, excuse me, trust are well known in your consciences. For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf, that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. Or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time, I have heard you. In the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. This is the word of God. You may see it. So as we, as we work our way through this portion of Scripture, and as I, as I said, I, I want to notice in this portion of Scripture the centrality of the Gospel. The centrality of the Gospel and the effect that he, it had on, on Paul and 
then what he was called to in response to that gospel. We talk about, as I've been working my way through personal evangelism, there's sovereignty in election. Is there not? God will elect those he will call. God has those he's predestined from before the beginning of time. But is there not only just sovereignty, but running hand in hand with that is the personal responsibility of the believer to preach the gospel. In our portion of scripture, we see clearly Paul had been changed by the gospel. But then we see immediately that it moved him. It moved him to preach the gospel to all that were present. I want to see that, you know what? We have a responsibility. And sometimes I think those in the Reformed faith shirk the responsibility. If we've been touched by the gospel, we're called to preach the gospel. We're called to preach it to our family, to our friends, to our neighbors, to our, to our, to our people we don't know, people that are our neighbors, strangers. If the gospel has truly changed us, we're called to do that. In order to bring life to the world, we need to have experienced new life. Is that not true? We can't bring life if we have no life. So there's the starting point. God created all things gloriously, we've seen the last couple weeks in Genesis. In his creation, Jesus uh, created the stars and the moon and the sun. He was involved in all of creation. And creation was for him, through him, by him. But there's something else that happens very amazingly in our portion of scripture. It's creation again. It's new creation in those that are unbelievers, transformed from death to life. It's as glorious as creation itself, and I think we'll see that. Uh, one of the ideas I want to see here in this portion of Scripture, and I think should drive us, and we find in Luke, for everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required, and to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask all the more. <coughs> see, the idea here is those who have been reconciled, are called then to bring the word of reconciliation to a lost and dying world. And I'm telling you what, God's made a choice to use believers to do that. He sovereignly chooses who he will. He calls them. And then you know what? He calls them by the means of prayer. We pray for our lost ones. We pray for our, our children. We pray for our neighbors. And then you know what? Someone needs to bring the word of reconciliation. And that's us. So I want to see in this portion of scripture uh, that there's three different points I want to cover. Motivation to preach, message, message preached, and power to preach. Three points. I found too, I feel a little bit exonerated in the, the study on doing gospel project. They always have three points each week. So I think it's a, it's a, good, it's a good thing to follow. But let's start off with uh, the motivation to preach. And we find there in verse 10 and 11, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. A little bit later, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. So fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We hear, saw that in Psalms. Let me tell you what, fear is a real motivator. Fear is a motivator for Paul to persuade men. Fear, I'm sure, motivated him to come to faith as he was knocked off that, that horse. And he said, who are you, Lord? I think he was struck with awe and fear and wonder, and he came to the Lord. So there's no doubt that fear is a motivating uh, factor. I've heard testimonies recently, some from our young ones, talking about how they were afraid. And, and, and that fear drove them to want to put their faith and hope in Christ so that they might know that they had eternal life. It's a wonder. It's wonderful. Uh, if you don't have a proper fear and awe of the creator God, and if you're not right with the Lord, fear is something you should, should bring you to your knees and drive you to have trust in God. We're going to see a dual thing in here. You're going to see, first of all, the gospel has to have an effect on the believer, and then second of all, you're going to see because of that effect, because of the life, then we're going to have the motivation to move forth and to do these other portions of preaching the gospel. The gospel has to have had an effect on us. You have to be born again. Uh, he says, because of the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. You know, if you're walking down the street and, and you're a good neighbor and you happen to notice that, you know what, your, your neighbor's house is on fire, you know, and you know that they're in there sleeping, you're not going to just walk by and go home and go to sleep, are you? 
you're going to run in there, you're going to knock on the door, and if it's possible, you're going to carry them out because you're afraid for their lives. Well, let me tell you what. There is a terror worse than burning to death in a fire. There is a fire that waits, as we've seen as Jesus preached, for all of those that don't come to Christ. There's the fires of hell. So you know what? Let's persuade men to repent, turn from the, their, their sins, and turn to the living God. That fear should be something that motivates us. It should be something that motivates those of us who maybe haven't come to bow the knee, that haven't committed your life to Christ. Fear is a real thing. You know, the, it says that uh, our, our God is a consuming fire. Uh, he's awe-inspiring. And he's made a way, though, that we don't have to have fear. He's brought that through Christ. So what matters to us? Uh, let's see this next portion here. As we, if we, as we looked into the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talked about being wholeheartedly devoted. We saw the duality of life. Is our heart tied up in the things of the earth, or is our heart tied up in love for God? Where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. I've contended when we started Matthew that all of the uh, letter writers, Paul and all the others, they go back to the tradition that they were taught from Jesus. And I think we see this right here as Paul is preaching. Look at verse 12. That you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. You see, there were those there, there were false uh, teachers and those who were trying to lead them astray, those that were uh, consumed with the way things looked on the outside. They would lead these folks astray and they didn't teach them what was truly important. And what is Paul saying? It's not those things that you may have an answer, that you don't boast in appearance, but that you boast in the heart. So there Paul is getting to the heart of the matter. Um, so, so we need to be motivated out of love for, for the right things. Our heart should be caught up with those things of God and not the things of the earth. Um, the next step here I see for a motivation is 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died, and he died for all. Love is a motivator, is it not? Mm -hmm. God first loved us, so we love him. What's the motivate? one of the greatest motivations that cause us to come to the end of ourselves and come and put faith in Christ is the love that he's had for us, that he died for us. And I know that that's what's compelled Paul to be devoted to the Lord. But it also, once it says well, he's died, we all have died. We're called to have that same self-sacrifice that Jesus had. That love that's only shown through giving your life up for your brother. Tim brought it up this morning that we're called to love. And then Jesus said, but I've given you a new commandment. That you love each other as I've loved you. It's what Paul's talking about here. It's about self-sacrifice. Giving ourselves to uh, the Lord and then giving ourselves to each other out of love. Do you love your neighbor? You're going to want to preach the gospel to him. You're going to be motivated to share that love. That love that's been lavished on you. Are you going to be so uh, stingy as to hoard the love of Christ? God has lavished on us through the, through the Son. The Father so loved the world and gave His Son. Lavished love upon us. That love needs to pour out of us to the lost and dying. If we've been touched by the gospel, then we need to touch others with the message of reconciliation. Uh, have you ever seen folks in love? you ever been in love? All you can think about is, is, is your beloved. I, I know when I first <coughs> fell for Michelle, that's all I could think about, you know. Uh, this, this is the woman that God gave me. I just know it. And, and I love her and I want to be with her. And, and so I know the best way for that is we had to get married. So, I mean, I, we got engaged in April and married in October. I think we had one date and that was it. I, I was hooked. I was in love. You know, you hear other people when they're, when they're in love that, you know, oh, I wish these guys would just shut up. I get it. You love each other, right? But have, have we ever, have we lost our first love? That's how we should be about Jesus every day. That's what we should be about what the gospel has affected us. If the love of Christ has touched you through the gospel and through what the Lord has done for you, that love, we have got to let it out. And the way for us to let it out, we have to tell others. We have to tell others that, that there is a way that they can experience true love. 
there is a way that they can come in into relationship with the Creator who created all men, as we heard earlier, in the image of God. That love is God to pour out. Have you been changed by the gospel? Are you looking to persuade men to turn to Christ? Paul was turned by the gospel, and he was commended and, and challenged. Now he had a job to carry forth the gospel. Look what it says there. He died for all, that those who live should no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. So first and foremost, we live for who? We live for Christ. We should do everything out of devotion and love for him. And then since we live for him, we're called to share that with others. That's the first portion there. The motivation for preaching the gospel. If we've been touched, we need to share it. Let's look at the message of the gospel, point two. I'm try I tried to devise a message that would be a little shorter today because we've got a business meeting, and you're all welcome to stay, but I can't guarantee anything. So, we need to have a clear understanding of what the message is. Do you have a clear understanding of what the gospel is? I'm surprised at so many people I talk to that don't have a clue what the points of the gospel are. Where, where does, who is God? Who is man? What's the problem? Sin is the division. God's holy. There's a huge problem. We can't be in the presence of a holy God and be sinful. We're all born in sin. All of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. So listen, someone who's been a Christian, they've been a member of the church for years, what's God done for you? Um, uh, uh, it should be, read, the, read your lips. What has he done for me? He died for me. Didn't we hear it? He died for all. The gospel is going to be clearly delineated right here in this portion of scripture. And it's so clear. First of all, we're going to need to have a clear understanding of the gospel. If I've learned anything going through this preaching uh, personal evangelism, it's that we need to know the gospel. How are you going to share the gospel with your neighbor if you don't personally know the gospel? And if you don't know it, it would make me be concerned whether the gospel's had a real effect on you. So let's just cover the points of the gospel so that we can be clear, because Paul makes it really clear. We know that Jesus died for all. That's a port us from the gospel. You hear people say, well, what's the gospel? Jesus died for me. Okay, well, what's that mean? And what, what's your response? And people don't know. We need to know, first of all, so we can be assured of our place in heaven, of our relationship with the Lord. Secondly, we need to know so that we can go forth and preach the gospel. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. How do you preach it if we don't know the points of it? That's why Tommy came here, and that's why some of the, they'll come and they'll equip you on how, oh, I'm not going to use a gospel book. That's too impersonal. I'm, well, listen, if you can know it clear down and you, you don't have to have any helps to share the gospel, God bless you. But you know what? Gospel helps are wonderful. First of all, we need to know the gospel, and then there's wonderful tools that we can use when we go and reach out. You know, and I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed that, you know what? I don't share the gospel other than here. I can't tell you how many years it's been since I reached out to someone. I, I, I need to repent of that, and I need to share the gospel, because you know what? God will draw men to himself. We have the word of reconciliation here, as Paul says, but we need to, first of all, know the gospel has affected us. Then we need to understand it and carry it forth. So let's see what Paul says about what's the gospel in a nutshell. Look at verse 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Here is an amazing thing. In that little verse is contained the gospel. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. It's about substitutionary atonement. You see, here's the deal. We've all sinned, as it said, and fallen short of the glory of God. We all, because of our sin, deserve the fire of hell. But God's made a way that we can become the righteousness of Christ. How do, uh, righteousness of God, how does that happen? So all of sin, Jesus became sin for all of those who put faith in him. He took the penalty in the punishment for sin. So you repent, first of all, of your sin, and you turn to God in faith, and it, the, the way that's occurred is through his death on the cross, in his burial. And then you'll see in there, it always, though, talks about his resurrection. 
If Jesus never rose again from the dead, it's all meaningless. But see, how many times did Jesus sin in his life? Big fat zero. The wages of sin is death. Jesus didn't deserve to die, but he willingly laid down his life as a substitute for all of those that will put their faith in him. We don't need to talk about religion. You talk about the gospel. You don't need to talk about going to church. You don't talk about this. You need to know about substitutionary atonement. We need to know about being lost in sin. If you're sitting here today and you're not sure your sins have been covered through faith in Christ, if you're not sure you put all your faith in his substitutionary atonement, you better put your faith in Christ today. I couldn't lay out or explain substitutionary death any better than was prophesied by Isaiah. So let me just read it. Isaiah 53, verses 5 to 6, if you want to follow along. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. There it is. That's the gospel. That's exactly what Paul is pointing to there. So we need to understand the gospel. You can't tell people the gospel if you don't understand the gospel. You can't tell people the gospel if you've not personally been affected it by it by being reconciled. You know, you, you look at, um, you, you think about how are we going to reconcile this or that. Uh, you know, you're always working your checkbook, right? Uh, I, I've recently, for years and years, I just put that job off on Michelle. She was raising seven kids, teaching them, doing everything, and then just going nuts. Finally, I started to take care of the checkbook. And you've got to reconcile your checkbook. You can't have more going out than's coming in or you're going to be in the red. Well, here's the deal. Sin has put us in the red. So far, we aren't ever getting out. But Jesus came along paid the penalty, and he's brought our bank account up to full. He's brought it up to the righteousness of God. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. How are you in Christ Jesus? That's through faith. There is a test to tell whether or not we've been reconciled. Have you been born again? Have you passed from death to life? Are you sure of it? Have you been recreated? I talked at the beginning about creation. The wonder of creation. Here is one of the most memorized and glorious verses in all of the New Testament. And this is the true test. Do you want to take the test today? Do you want to know if the Gospels had an effect on you? You better be able to live up to uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled to us to himself through Jesus Christ. That explains the gospel and the purpose for it. For making new creations. We were dead in sin and trespasses. You know, a real good way you can see how sin works with a, uh, someone who's lost, it's like when Jesus went four days after Lazarus was dead. And he was laying in the tomb, wrapped up, in the, in, in, in the grave clothes, he was already rotting. You know, I think it was Martha and Mary said, I'm sure, Lord, he, he stinketh, if you read the King James. And, and he was dead, gone. But what did Jesus say? Lazarus, come forth. And he came to life. That's what happens in every person who ever comes to Jesus. They have to be recreated. They have to be called. We're not saved by our own faith apart from grace. God gives us the grace to believe. But you know what? There has to be feet that bring the message. There has to be someone to tell them. And I can tell you, if you're in Christ, you're a new creation. I changed that day I came to the Lord. When I was 19 years old, I've never, ever been the same. Have I been perfect? No. But I was a new creation. There's no doubt about it. I couldn't even live my old way because it was uncomfortable. So listen, if we understand the gospel rightly, if we put our faith in Christ, if we're depending upon the substitutionary work, if we are indeed a new creation, now we're able to carry forth the mandate and we, we repopulate. Just as we're called to be fruitful and multiply in Genesis, Christian, you're called to be fruitful and multiply. 
when's the last time you shared the gospel with someone? James, when is the last time you shared the gospel with someone? I'm forced every week to have at least one witnessing account, right? I've had them with my son-in-law. I had it with my sister. I mean, these are real important things. If you want to look about who are you going to preach the gospel to, start your circle. First, you start with your family. Then after your family, start with your neighbors. After your neighbors, start with strangers. We need to open our mouths and share the gospel. If we are new creations in Christ, we need to preach it. And this week, i got to go completely out of my comfort zone and go to a stranger. And then I've got to record the thing. I'm telling you, listen, it's hard. I'm finding it hard to witness. It's hard to witness. But I'm telling you what, we cannot but witness. It, and like I said last week, there's a, a, a quote of Spurgeon. I couldn't find it. But he said, if you're, you as a Christian are not sharing your testimony, then he said, I doubt whether or not you're really a Christian. Now listen, only God knows our hearts, right? But I can tell you, Paul makes it clear. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. We're called. We have the word of reconciliation. If the gospel's had that effect on us, we're called to recreate it in others. And, and you know, I talked about that being called from death to life. We're talking right now about the message of the gospel. I don't think it's any more been made clear than in the song by Charles Wesley. And this supposedly was a song he wrote possibly early after his uh, regeneration, new birth. Some say even the next day. Well, listen to what Wesley wrote in his great hymn, And Can It Be? Long thy imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. And if we have had that experience that Charles Wesley had, we're going to rise, go forth, and follow him. What's our Lord doing? God was in uh, the Christ redeeming the world to himself. You know where Christ and God are now? They're in the church redeeming the world to themselves. We're called to carry forth the, 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 the word of reconciliation. New creation is about reconciliation. There's no better way to say it. Long our imprisoned spirits lay, found bound in the sin of nature's night. But God delivers those who trust. If you've not had that experience, give up. Lay down your life. Turn from your sin. Put all your hope and faith in Christ. He's able to save to the utmost. Not able to just to, to bring our bank book up to snuff, but enough that he paid for all of our sins, past, present, and future. And if we're that type of believer, how do we keep that to ourselves? How do you keep that good news yourself? There's good news. I get something, something that, that I'm interested in. I can't, can't help but shut me up. You know, my brother and I and my sons are Yankee fans. Yankees are having a great year. So whenever we get together, hey, what about those Yankees? You can't shut us up. We know the message. The message is the Yankees are going to win the World Series. The message now here is he has won. He's conquered death, hell, and the grave. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? We have this message. Are we going to carry it out and carry it to our neighbor? First, we need to know the message. It needs to have changed us, and then we can carry it forth. Now, here's the question. Where is the power to preach the gospel? Do we have to, to work it up within ourselves? We didn't even have to be saved that way. That was a gift. Look at what Paul says here. In verse 19 to 20, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Remember when Jesus preached? He was one man carrying the gospel. What was he doing? He preached the gospel of the kingdom as he went. One man. Now, could God have carried it out so that he could have spoke to every man the gospel? He could have. That's how he turned Paul. Jesus spoke directly to him, knocked him off his, his, his horse. God could have... Just let Jesus, after he rose again from the dead, just go around to every, every generation and preach the gospel. That's not how God decided to do it. God had a plan. First, it was God reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not imputing their trespasses to them. But what has he done? And has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. We have a message. 
who has carried out that ambassadorship properly? Anybody here think you've done a tremendous job? Tommy, I think, might be able to say he preached it. Was he saying four times a day he shares the gospel? Oh, he's just Tommy. He's bless, bless his heart. Isn't that special? But listen, whatever it is that God's calling you to do, has he done something in your life? Does the gospel mean something to you? Paul says here that he's committed to us the word of reconciliation. It's, oh, that was Paul. Paul had that job. That's not our job. No, no, come on. We're called to bring the word to the lost, to our neighbors, to our, our, make them sick to hear about it. Oh, you know what, though, James? If I talk like that, they're going to think I'm one of those crazy Christians. They're going to think, oh, you're one of those, aren't you? Maybe they're not going to wave to me when I come home at night anymore. My neighbors will go, that Jim, he's Jim. I'm James now. I used to be Jim at the old church. <laughs> that James is crazy. He just won't shut up about Jesus. Well, I got news for you. Let's not be embarrassed of Christ so that he might be embarrassed of us. Let's boldly proclaim the word of reconciliation. Start praying for that neighbor. Tommy said there was somebody who prayed for 15 years. Start praying for them and then be the answer. Be the one that shares it with them. Uh, I, I, I see there's no other way for us to do it. it. talks about it being ambassadors. You know, in America, well, we have many embassies in many different countries. And in those countries, those ambassadors and those embassies, they speak for our president. They speak for this nation to those people. Guess what? We speak for the kingdom of the God of heaven who has brought his kingdom to earth. This kingdom is already in the, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's been instituted in a, and inaugurated in Christ. We're called now to carry that word forth. J.I. Packer puts it this way. The motive that should prompt us to assiduously evangelize is what? Love of our neighbor and the desire to see our fellow humans saved. They're pretty nasty. I don't really care if they get saved or not. Actually, he's the worst neighbor in the world. No love even our enemies. The wish to win the lost for Christ should be, and indeed is, the natural, spontaneous overflow of love in the heart of everyone who has been born again. It's natural. If it's not happening, something's wrong. Ah, uh, listen or not. God's got ways of doing things, and I, I forget what the, who the missionary was that went to, to China. Anybody know who I'm talking about? And he, he came up, he was a young guy, came up before the elders and said he wanted to carry the gospel to the heathen. And, and one of the elders said, sit down, young man. When God's good and ready to save the heathen, he'll do it himself. And it's like, you all should know that guy. And I should know it right here and do my research. Hudson, uh, I think so. China, right? He was in China. Right. So Hudson Taylor, was he was a reformed dude. But he also understood the scriptures. Any good reformed man is going to obey the scriptures. And God's going to save the heathen through us. Your friends, your family, your neighbors need to hear it. They're going to hear it from us. Where does the power come from? Look at verse 20. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God's desire to implore the lost is through us. We're God's vessels. The power comes from God. We're laborers together with God. We have a responsibility to plead with the lost, to plead with them. Uh, the, the, this week when I was going through the class, it said, folks come to the Lord after hearing the gospel no less than 10 times. It's not very often that someone hears it the first time and comes to the Lord. Our kids, we preach the gospel to them daily. They're blessed to hear it. I think I came the first time now. I remember I heard it the first time. I was like, what? I'm in. So, but I, I'm sure there was other times I didn't remember, but just that one so strikes home to me. But if we do, uh, here's the deal. God supplies the power. We're his voice to a lost and dying world. Uh, if you don't uh, understand, if you don't believe Paul saying it, let's look at him say it again. Look at verse 6, verse 1, Corinthians. We then, as workers together with him, we are co-laborers together with God. The gospel is powerful in and of itself. The gospel is a powerful message of salvation to bring sinners to Christ, to bring sinners to God, to reconcile us to the Lord. 
But that power now is, is brought to our neighbors, to our loved ones, through us. The power is given to us by the Father through the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Who's going to share the gospel this week? I'm not convinced you have I? You better read that portion of scripture again. Who, who's going to share the gospel this week? See, they're, you know what? They're all committed to the Lord. So they know if they raise their hands, they have to do it. You know? Listen, let's try to have some testimonies the next week that we share the gospel. That's such a bad thing. Yes. If the gospel has meant everything to you, who are you to hoard that love? Who are you to, to keep that from a lost and dying world? Who am I to keep it? I want to be more diligent. Hold me to that. Hold me to that. I want to reach out to our community and, and, and somehow figure out a way to share the gospel with them. I want to reach out to that neighbor across the street that I said, I'm going to go over there. They've been living there for five years. Uh, when they first moved in, I said, let's bring a flower. We didn't do it. Let's do it. Each year I think about going over there. I'm going to do it. This week, the cookies you gave me, Louisa, for Christmas, Michelle and I are going to make those up. I'm going to let Michelle help me because I don't want to hurt my neighbor. And then I'm going to try <laughs> to find an opportunity to share the gospel. Here in closing, in closing, here's the, the admonition from Paul. Read with me and look along. In 2 Corinthians, you still have your, word of, your, your copy of God's word on your lap. Uh, Corinthians 6, 1 and 2. We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time I have heard you. In the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. If you have not put your faith in Christ, if you have not dedicated your life to him and to follow him, not just as Savior, but as Lord, today is the acceptable day. Today is the day of salvation. If you've been touched by the gospel and changed, I would say with Paul, not to receive the grace of God in vain. Don't let him waste it on us. Let's pour it out to our neighbors. The grace that has come to us in Christ, the lavish love, let's carry it out. If we could come and do our last song. You know, God is pleading with a dying and lost world through us. You know what's cool? I get to preach each week, and I get to do it here, so I get to have that, that honor of preaching God's word. It's not just for the pastor. It's for everybody. We are all called. We're all given the word of reconciliation to be carrying that to a lost world. Listen, one plants, one waters, but God brings the increase. I can assure you, you will not have a harvest if you don't plant or you don't, uh, you, you, you don't water. Jonathan, how much crop do you get when you don't plant? Nothing. You know, I can go for a hockey, there's a hockey illustration. Wayne Gretzky, greatest goal scorer of all time, he said he never scored a goal if you didn't take the shot. We have to take the shot. We have to share the gospel. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your lavish love that you poured out on, on us in Christ, that you were in Christ redeeming the world to yourself, of which we are a portion of that, of that harvest. Lord God, each of us most likely had someone that spoke the word to them. Whether it was mom or dad, faithfully, opening up the scriptures and, and sharing Christ with us. Whether it was a stranger that came across and told us the good news. Father, I pray that we might be they, that we might be they that carry the word of reconciliation to a lost and dying world. God, we pray for a revival. We pray for revival in our neighborhoods, in our state, in our country. We know, God, that you are able. Use us, Lord, to be your hands and your feet and to voice the gospel. Bring in a harvest, we pray. Challenge us, Lord. Help us in this endeavor. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Anderson.